Stay tuned now for About Face with host Chiron Dawkins, discussing how families can achieve excellence. Good afternoon, uh, and welcome to About Face broadcast, where we give information, resources, and tools for families to achieve communities of excellence. I'm your host, Chiron Dawkins. And before we get into our segment today, I would like to illustrate that our intent is to tackle and to prevent both service member and civilian families uh, from prospering, these issues that are causing them not to prosper. While the service member and civilian families have unique and differing backgrounds, they ultimately will share the same community and in many interrelating problems. And, you know, it is our opinion that a problem for one is a problem for us all. One of the premier problems facing families and communities today is that of veteran homelessness. And let me say that it is egregious that in the world's leading nation that homelessness even exists. And far worse that it would happen in record numbers to those who have defended our freedoms both here and abroad. Having worked on the front lines of this issue for several years now, I'm not only sensitive to it, but have had my eyes open to what happens on the ground and also what happens behind the scenes. We're part of a national effort, the Race to Zero. It's the movement to see zero veterans homeless by December 31st of this year, 2015. Uh, and we do believe that this is possible in the Hudson Valley, and that there's a process that could be put in place to ensure that no veteran becomes homeless or remains homelessness in homelessness for any length of time. Our functional zero process is that process that ensures as veterans enter housing crisis that there is an immediate intervention that uh, alleviates the issue uh, and brings them to stability. And today I have with me for our frontline worker segment, U.S. Marine veteran Guadalupe Mendoza and First Sergeant U.S. Army retired Stephen Vaughn. I welcome you now both to the show. Thank you. Thank you. And so, Stephen, uh, tell us a little bit about who you are, uh, your military service, and what it is that you do now. Uh, well, I went into the military in October of 1977. Uh, I was stationed at Fort Benning for my training. I went to jump school, drill sergeant school, sniper school, and I ended up uh, having tours in Iraq, uh, Korea. And I retired in 1998. My last duty station was at of Fort Drum, Fort Drum New York. Um, I currently am working at the West Cop Mount Vernon office uh, for the SSVF program, which is support services for veterans and their families. And I assist uh, veterans who are either facing eviction or is liter are literally homeless. And Guadalupe, tell us a little bit about who you are, your military service, and what you do now. Well, I served four years of active duty from 2005 to 2009. And I played a lot of key roles in the Marine Corps, representing the female Latinas traveling with uh, during the presidential campaign of President Obama and Senator McCain. Um, I had an ex a very, very um, amazing experience during my military service, as well as my transition out of the military. Well, that's good. And so this question is for uh, both of you. Uh, what was that transition like? What was the discharge planning like? And uh, if you will, how, how did it prepare you to return to civilian life? Well, as a, a re, uh, as a first sergeant retiring, um, we're given uh, more time to transition. Uh, it's a privilege serving that position, but I got six months worth of transitioning, of which uh, I was able to uh, ensure that my medical files were taken care of, uh, that any appointments that I needed to have for dental and medical were taken care of. I was actually able to uh, go out and, and, and find a position, a job. Um, and I, but I understand that that's only because I retired. And as a first sergeant, I had more privileges than those who are not retired and who are lower ranking individuals. Um, so I was, my transition was pretty smooth. I went from the military to working at the prep school for West Point in Guadalupe? Well, my experience was, um, you know, not as smooth as, you know, retired first sergeant, um, Mr. Vaughn, but my transition was a little bit more difficult because I 
was only for four years and we only had a three day period of where you go to courses transitioning and um, kind of scenarios of what you would expect in you know being involved in the civilian quote unquote world um, one thing that they did um, you know say over and over again is that you will never be able to um, relate to the civilian person anymore and in my experience I held these key roles in being you know the face of the female Latinas of the Marine Corps or you know walking around with very high key um, you know leaders of our national you know country and then I found myself in a position where I was um, I couldn't find employment um, you know I my my skills were not were too when were overlooked, I, be, I believed in, in, you know, when I was applying for positions. And then, um, so luckily I had the GI Bill and I was able to go to school. But during this time, um, there was either times where I found myself, uh, you know, the VA GI Bill benefits were not coming in month to month, you know, four months, you know, I was expecting pay. And then I found myself where, how am I gonna pay my rent? You know, I'm trying to go to school, I'm not working, I'm trying to find work. And my resume was kind of being pushed aside. So it was really difficult as far as my transition. And then from there came either, you know, either some depression or not understanding my value in the civilian world. You, you made a, a key statement there. You said mm -hmm. that uh, during that time of the three day period, uh, and I'll ask you to clarify, uh, that they were drilling into your head that you would never understand, if you will, uh, what it was like to be a civilian again when you returned. Right. Now, now, now how do you feel about that? I mean, is that is that the case? Is that well, true? you know, I think they say that to say, you know, you're now you have a an, an experience and a leadership that was taught that no education could buy, which is true. Our military um, personnel are the best of the best. Uh, you know, we're a patriotic country, and they really do show this this great leadership and work ethic to the military. So I think in that sense. Um, and your needs, you know, many things that you are taught from boot camp all the way into your military career, whether you're retiring or, or only doing a, a short term contract. Um, and, you know, and, and and that said, it's very difficult to understand the civilian life as far as being, you know, they're they get a, away with being late or um eating and walking and you know having messy hair or things like that where the military person takes a very high pride in themselves in their body working out um eating healthy um many things as such so i think that's what they say that you will never be able to understand the the civilian life again because now you're upheld to a higher standard i mean you're our nationals military <laughs> you know so I think that's it. Steve, you have anything to uh, say about that? I mean, well, you, you didn't have a three-day period. No, so. but, I, I've got, <laughs> but I've got to tell you, the 21 years in the military made it difficult for me to transition into the civilian sector because I had 21 years. So the military was ingrained in me and the structure. So I wasn't used to uh, working in a, an arena in which um, you punch in, you punch out, and it's just there was it, there was no camaraderie and and that's the one thing i must say after all these years i still miss the camaraderie that i had with individual soldiers that i fought with in iraq that uh, we would die for one another we just it's it's a totally different mindset but in the 17 years i've been retired i've now adjusted somewhat yeah. <laughs> So after seventeen years, <laughs> <laughs> yes. you 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 have you finally. have now <laughs> finally <laughs> finally adjusted. Finally, he's finally adjusted. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, do you think it's going to take you seventeen years? I know. I I don't think so. I think um you know I think my family had a big involvement in my you know adjusting back. They still don't fully understand my my dominance or my alpha personality or really my resilience to many situations or obstacles that have you know thrown at my life um so i think that can catch people off guard and say what's wrong with her or you know she needs therapy or something because usually most people wouldn't be able to handle situations you know where the military had prepared you i mean you're really training for war 
um, you know, and that that is the most traumatic and yet most real, you know, experience uh, um, situation that that you have to um, that only the military can really train you is how to, you know, deal with life at after that. So I know you had something. To if say. I may, I think one of the I don't know if using the term detriment is appropriate, but I'm a one thing is most difficult for veterans getting out, whether it be two years, four year, six year, whatever. Um, they will try to fix the problem themselves. They won't ask for help. They're not. They they feel as though they can they can accomplish what they need to accomplish because in the military you're trained that way. Mm-hmm. You're trained that you're it's the, you're mission oriented and you're going to accomplish the mission. So when we get out, we don't look. We look at we look at asking for help as a weakness. So there are veterans out there right now who who believe still believe that, and they're the last to ask for help. And that's why it's so important that we reach out to them. And so that that may speak back to that civilian mindset, mm-hmm. because I think the civilian yes. certainly not <laughs> will insulting ask, you will, guys will <laughs> ask for help a little bit quicker, right? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Um, you know, be, being on the front lines at times myself, certainly I have seen it uh, where it's been very difficult uh, to be able to reach uh, the veteran because the veteran is so self-reliant. Um, mm-hmm. And you'll get the opportunity to talk about some of your field <coughs> stories since you've been back. Uh, but certainly, you know, I've seen some of the greatest ingenuity uh, to survival, uh, you know, right here on uh, the terra firma here. Uh, seeing what uh, veterans will do to survive. And that does make it difficult to reach out and potentially even to family. And so you talked about having a strong uh, family network. Could you just expound on that a little bit? You know, uh, how many uh, family members, if you will, did, did you have that were like immediately waiting for you? And, uh, you know, how have they been uh, helpful in the process? Okay, so um, definitely my mother had a big role in in um, welcoming me back home. I was able to stay with her um, during my rough um, few months that I had. Really was probably the second year of me coming out of the Marine Corps. Uh, the first year was, you know, I was still on fast pace mode. I was, um, I was still motivated, I was still in that mindset. But then when things started slowing down, that's when things started, um, you know, getting difficult for me. Um, <clears throat> just going to school, I was pregnant. Um, my child's father was also uh, a, a, a war veteran, twice deployed, and he just couldn't deal with it as well. We both transitioned out together. And noticingly, within a, a year into our you know, transition to civilian life, he... Um, wasn't able to handle or cope with life anymore. Uh, didn't work. Um, I was the one only providing. I was pregnant now. Now I'm single. And my mother had a really big role in keep, you know, holding me together, per se, helping me in school and transitioning. So, um, you know, I think it's very, very important. And it's our, you know, as an SSVF worker, I think it's now time for us to um, educate and inform our community and everyone around us how important it is to um, mandate and and deliver proper um, help t- for our veterans that are not coming back. And we're progressive from you know from our Vietnam era to now. It's came a very long way as far as the services that are there. Um, you know, our program is one of the biggest ones, SSVF uh, West Cop. Uh, without that, we wouldn't ha- be able to help the the hundreds of local veterans in our community getting to where they are. So I, I want to talk about that mm-hmm. quest for services when it is time to look for services. But I do want to remind our listeners that they are listening to About Face. Yes. Uh, we are on WVOX, and you're listening to uh, uh, First uh, Sergeant Retired uh, from the U.S. Army, uh, Stephen Vaughn, and also... Uh, U.S. Uh, Marine veteran Guadalupe Mendoza. 
and this is your host, Kyron Dawkins. And so uh, going forward, uh, is there anything that would have made the process easier or better for you? And when you were in that quest to look for benefits, uh, you both have two totally uh, different stories. But when you were in the quest to look for benefits that you were, if you will, entitled to, what did you find? How was that process? Well, the VA could have been more proactive in reaching out and letting us, letting me know uh, what was available, what was not available. Uh, I got my education while I was in, and the only reason why I continued with my education was only through voc rehab. And I found out about voc rehab, ro- vocational rehabilitation by, mis- by, by just sitting at the VA trying to get my ID card, and someone said, you're 30% disabled. Do you know you're entitled to go back to school? I never knew. The VA never told me. So because of that one individual that I met, not by mistake, um, I was able to continue with my my degree. So the VA needs to be more proactive, in my opinion. I mean, they do a great service to veterans, but they need to be a little bit more proactive into uh, ensuring that vets are afforded the opportunity to know what's available to them for them. And I think it's, um, you know, that's on a federal level, the VA and our local VA hospitals. But I also think it's our community, our local community's obligation to reach out to our local veterans. Um, I think if, uh, you know, our veteran services at my college, for example, or my local city hall or, you know, just all these different entities that make up your local government or your local community, whether it's nonprofit or, you know, government, uh, would have would have been able to inform me of many services that are out there. So I wouldn't or, or many veterans would not have to struggle you know, of them leaving the mil- their trans- during their transition period. So how did you find your information? How, how did you find out about services? How, um, how did you end up finding out about SSVS? I, from, well, from that was just uh, from reaching out to different organizations on myself, from myself being this, uh, you know, this naturally motivated individual, which, you know, most people are not. It's a very small percentage that are self-motivated. Uh, me, I was reaching out. And I found SSVF and then, um, you know, called the proper channels to get in touch with the right person in that program. Okay. So just navigating that process and the search, the the search took you more time than it should have. Correct. Ultimately. Yes. Okay. And so we we need to find a way to make that process easier, uh, simpler. Agreed. Yes. And so uh, supportive services for veterans and their families. Uh, You both are part of an award-winning program. Yes. Uh, You uh, won the Innovation Collaboration Excellence Award from Syracuse University, and also uh, the program has been recognized by the George Bush uh, Military Institute, uh, being one of 25 uh, nonprofits out of 45,000 in the space, uh, having best practices in that area. Uh, So explain a little bit about what you do in SSVF, uh, why it's important, and what challenges you face. Well, I, I, it, SSVF is geared towards, uh, it, it's, a 90, it's 90 days in which we, from the date that we receive a veteran who's either facing eviction or literally homeless, um, to get them either housed, rapidly housed, or stop with the eviction process. Um, and um, it's, it's, it's time sensitive because we only have the 90 days. So we 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 make it a point to ensure that um, that veteran and his or her family understands what we are offer, what's offered to them through the SSVF program, and we it just doesn't stop there with the housing. We also refer them out to other resources that could help them in in uh, other circumstances they may find themselves in. Now, when you talk about the ninety days, of course, that is your target. Uh, yes. you're, you're, you're targeting, you're time sensitive, everything is rapid. Correct. You don't want the veteran to be in a situation for a long period of time. Correct. Uh, and in fact, that 90 days is faster uh, than the majority of systems have been doing uh, intervention in the past. Uh, and so that's key. But if a veteran uh, should require longer assistance than that, you do have the option. I have two veterans right now who required lo- to be longer than the 90 day period. Uh, and we will continue to assist them. Okay. And uh, Guadalupe, explain what's what's SSVF uh, from your perspective. Well, from my perspective, it's uh, keeping veterans out of really um, 
in a situation where they they can't get out of on their own, where, you know, assisting them, getting them back on their feet and maintaining their housing stability. Um, just because, as you know, Stephen Vaughn said that it's a 90 day program, we will our main mission is to keep them stable in a housing situation. So it's not just 90 days of, you know, hurry up, get them housed, and then that's it, you know. Um, we want to make sure that they're being stable and also carry on um, our outside um, resources. So maybe not just be by us, but also um, uh, educating them of resources, either if it's mental health or other financial entities that they could benefit from, whether it's furniture or um, providing beds for them or household necessities. These are all things that um, many veterans can't sometimes do on their own, and they do need that support or that just getting them back back on their feet so they can maintain that proper lifestyle that they did have in the military. Well, we have many veterans uh, that require overlapping services mm -hmm. from other agencies. So we, we coordinate those services and we communicate with those uh, other entities to ensure that the veteran and their families are taken care of. Now you both started to speak about it. Uh, are, are there some unique challenges uh, to dealing with the veteran population in this space of homelessness or housing crisis? Yes. Um, well, the biggest thing sometimes that, you know, and it's kind of tricky, but mental health t takes a key role um, in, in help in get providing services for these veterans. Sometimes it, there, these are barriers that will prevent us from helping them um, getting services. However, if we just um, um, let the veteran know of of all these other community outreach programs that they can use, whether it's local or through the VA, it will help their their housing stability so that they won't fall behind or be in, in the situation that they're in. Well, funding is always an issue. I mean, we could use additional funds, mm -hmm. but but the fact of the matter is we, um, you know, we have, we have funds to assist, but it, it does present a problem sometimes when we're approaching the end of the FY in which dollars are scarce. Of course, we will always not turn down a veteran. We refer them out to other resources, but funding can be an issue. Right. For even those, thir those, um, uh, res from those, oops, from those people that, uh, we, uh, you know, try to get, um, uh, funding from. So, you know, it can be scarce. I can't hear my <laughs> What, what type of conditions do you find, uh, the, the veteran living in? Um, I, uh, it, there's so different, there's an array of conditions, but there's one that I will never forget. As long as I work here, as long as I've had the privilege of working as a, as a case manager, uh, it was an individual who was living in Putnam County and his storage facility was his, essentially was his home. Um, he had a van in which he had to uh, continually move around because the police would tell him that he could only stay there or here a couple days, but essentially the storage unit was his home. He would use a cooler for his refrigerator. And, um, but what really, what really, um, I remember finding an apartment for him in Orange County and we went to look at the apartment and, and when he went into the bathroom, he, uh, he turned on the faucet and it was tough. And he had mm -hmm. uh, look at the he looked at the the running water and he says, "Wow, I actually have running water." And so he'd been living in his van for eight years, not seen running water like this. And so that really uh, tugged at my heart, tugged at my heart. Excuse me. There there are so many that uh, are being brought in out of the woods, uh, out of parks, uh, sleeping in their cars, uh, sleeping in places that are not meant for human habitation. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Guadalupe, I'm not sure how much of that you have experienced uh, at this point, but uh, is there a story that, that you want to share? Yes, absolutely. Um, I'm working with a female now who, in the mail, she was in the Army, and she's a veteran now. Uh, she was a cryptus linguist, and now she has a baby uh, who is six months old, and she cannot find a job. She's applied for some jobs on USA.gov, and she's had no response from that. Very intelligent woman, young woman. 
she found herself homeless because her husband had left her during her time of of um, having the delivery of the baby. Uh, and now we're helping her to find housing. I mean, intelligent, intelligent woman. And you just question, how can she not find employment? How is no one, you know, employing this young female? Um, so, you know, that really, you know, touches my heart, you know, because I'm a female, I can relate, I'm motivated, she looks very motivated, and and very just on it. And, you know, I just don't understand sometimes. But it's it's a big, you know, it's a I think it's a local and national obligation for everyone to come together to um, bring awareness to this cause. Well, I say it all the time, and, and I'll say it everywhere I go, that uh, ultimately this should have been declared a national emergency. Right. You know, uh, we should have been a state of emergency, you know, in our states uh, and nationally. Whatever funds were needed uh, to funnel down for uh, the problem, uh, whatever land uh, needed to be utilized, right. <laughs> where some empty, vacant government buildings are sitting now right. uh, to put up housing or, or whatever was necessary should happen. Uh, and so I just want to let everybody know that uh, Friday, December the 18th, uh, we'll be having our winter blue carpet showcase and mixer. Yay. Uh, it's going <laughs> to be at uh, the Infusion Music Lounge, 600 Fifth Avenue, Pelham, New York, 10803. The tickets are $60. Uh, you can uh, contact us at 914 664 8680. And uh, this uh, About Face broadcast has been brought to you by Westcop. Uh, you can uh, go and uh, look at our services at www.westcop.org. Or you can go there and simply click the button, Donate Now. We like that button. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and uh, help us to continue uh, in the things that are happening. Thank you so much. Thank and you. And I'll see you next week at 1230. This is Kyron Dawkins signing off. AM 1460 W.